Welcome to Real Physics Talk. Today, my guest is Luise Rio Frio, and uh, she's a physicist, but she's not only a physicist, she's also an actress and worked for NASA. And uh, I think we will touch a lot of interesting topics in this talk. Welcome to Real Physics Talk, Luise. Oh, hi, Alexander, and thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. You just came back from a, uh, from a conference, from a journey, in, in where you talked about your cosmological model, or, oh. or talked about physics, or, or did you teach physics? Or Oh, yes. Well, I'm invited to, to do lectures all around the world. I was just in the Caribbean mm -hmm. on a ship for two weeks lecturing in the theater there, and it was very exciting. And mm -hmm. I talk about oh, cosmology, the universe, astronomy, yeah. and about how that affects our everyday lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, the audience would be interested, I mean, a little bit about your biography. So where did it start? Do you want to want to talk about your, uh, your life, how you came to be a scientist or how you, you started to, uh, as an actress or... Uh, Well, that, that's a, a very unusual biography, I guess, right? So, uh... Oh, yes, I'm a California girl. Um, I've always been fascinated with um, outer space and astronomy. When I was four years old, I appeared in television on a space show, and I was so young, I thought they filmed it in a real spaceship. Mm -hmm. It was a surprise to see that everything was made of painted wood. But I never forgot my interests. I'm educated in physics and astronomy at the universities in California. Oh, after that, I worked for the U.S. Navy and then uh, for NASA at Johnson Space Center in Houston, studying the moon, where I did experiments with moon samples that no one had touched in 45 years. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I've been working here on the island of Hawaii on a, an astronomy project to be landed on the moon, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that's successful and will be launched later this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so from the very beginning, you said as a little girl, so your family was were actors or how did you get into theirs? So, but but the connection was, I mean, it goes back to your childhood, so to speak, uh, being an actor and being a physicist interested in, in astrophysics or? Oh, yes. My mother was a teacher. My father was an engineer. He worked at Lockheed Skunk Works, mm -hmm. you know, where they built famous planes like the Stealth. Mm -hmm. And I've always been interested in astronomy and outer space, and I'm just very pleased and satisfied to have had a wonderful career doing those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, in a way, it was, um, uh, you had to make a decision because, I mean, you had considerable success as an actress, you were doing several films, and uh, so... Um, What, what, what was the plan? You, you always felt the need to, to be a scientist or this is, was just a nice hobby or was it really a decision uh, to take? Well, science is, was a wonderful career, but there were always periods, you know, between work or mm -hmm. even in the evenings. Sometimes mm -hmm. I would work at, at NASA during the day and then go rehearse for plays in the evening. Mm -hmm. There have been periods of my life when I've been between jobs and I've been... Mm -hmm easily been able to get work on films and television. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if if uh, our audience uh, Googles your name, you, you uh, f find your name in, in films. Uh, there are even, so to speak, spicy topics like, uh, I think it was like a film about 50 uh, Shades of Grey you participated. So uh, what was what was behind that or? Uh, oh, I should I should say on stage and television, I've played all sorts of characters. Mm -hmm. And oh, I have played Ladies of the Evening more than once mm -hmm. <laughs> on stage in a play called No Sex, Please, We're British. Mm -hmm. In another one called Christmas 911, they mm -hmm. thought I had the look for it. So mm -hmm. I have played Shady Ladies more than once. It's a very mm -hmm. big stretch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's interesting in a way because... I mean, it, it, it requires a little bit of courage, I think, to, to go out there and um, expose yourself in the public. And, and uh, courage is something which is, I think, missing a lot in today's scientific environment. In, in a way, I mean, we'll talk a lot then about your, your physical theories, but 
you're of course pursuing something which is off mainstream and um some people would uh would be very skeptical about this alternatives idea do you think that that's in your character that that kind of courage not caring too much about other people's views and uh and just doing what you think is right well people will often ask me you know why did i why did i discover evidence the speed of light is changing when no one else did why did i dare to think that a black hole could exist in our solar system even inside the earth mm. and i tell them it's not intelligence or even education it's character mm -hmm. the universities churn out intelligent people every day but mm -hmm. it requires character it requires courage you know and believing in yourself and what you do mm -hmm. and that's why people make breakthroughs even when working alone Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, I, I, I obviously I do agree. And there is a lot of, um, it's not just an opinion what you're stating. I mean, there is a lot of historical evidence that actually backs what you're saying. I mean, we can talk about Ignaz Semmelweiser, we can talk about Alfred Wegener, and, and the real big advances has always um, been achieved by, I mean, solitary Lun Wolves, so to speak. Uh, that's that's very characteristic of, of the history of science. So what was the, but uh, I mean, when I was a young scientist, I was interested, of course, in all this uh, stuff. But uh, at a certain point, you notice that, um, wow, there is some something real interesting, something that you might discover or something other people not not have noticed yet so as you say the the variable speed of light so when did that occur or in, in what uh what theory or what uh, what particular observation um uh, brought you to to that point well i had a lot of inspirations um paul dirac's work you know mm -hmm. with his cosmology yeah. and his large yeah. numbers hypothesis yeah, was that... a big inspiration that he was willing to think about such things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all this started with an attempt to link the local conditions of special relativity which don't allow for gravity with the large scale curved universe of general mm -hmm. relativity mm -hmm. and eventually i came up with some very simple equations mm -hmm. which explain uh, the size of the universe mm -hmm. you know Well, how that how that can change relate that to the speed of light even mm -hmm. to things like the Planck mass and the size of the cells in our bodies mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that and that has been the gift that keeps on giving mm -hmm. you know it can also predicts things about black holes that they should be very common in the universe even in the early universe mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and working and even before I worked and during the time I worked at NASA I was able to access data from the moon from the lunar samples and also from the lunar laser ranging experiment, which is a reflector mm -hmm. left on the moon. And in the data, mm -hmm. I found evidence that the speed of light had been mm -hmm. changing just as you mm -hmm. many times suggested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're covering many topics. Just uh, as a note for, for the audience, we will uh, put in the uh, in the comments, the, all your papers and, and books. Uh, you have uh, written a book and you have also a paper in uh, Journal of Applied Math and uh, Physics in, 19, uh, in 2021, right? And so uh, we may not go into every detail here, but uh, because it's always better to read that. But uh, yeah, certainly this is, this is uh, very intriguing. I mean, I myself working on that stuff and appreciate Dirac's or large number hypothesis um but it's it's a very i mean contemporary cosmologists usually don't care about uh about uh dirac's large numbers so so you were i mean you were just looking up that stuff in the library or how did how did you even get there i mean most people i think doing an, an astrophysics education in in a contemporary university they wouldn't even care about dirac's large numbers or Why? Oh, yes. I remember exactly where I encountered the work of Paul Dirac. It was mm -hmm. an article from 1988, Discover Magazine, which mm -hmm. I discovered in a library in Pensacola, Florida. 
a place mm-hmm. I worked while working with the U.S. Navy. Mm-hmm. And I still remember finding that magazine, that article, which introduced me to Paul Dirac mm-hmm. and his mm-hmm. cosmology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a little bit this was a starting point for uh, where things getting, wow, this is really interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Um, uh, so you're, you're supporting also the hypothesis that the gravitational uh, constant would uh, change over, over time? Well, I, 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 look at, I looked at that. So far, I mm-hmm. found no convincing evidence of it, but it's something that we should be willing to consider. If the mm-hmm. speed of light can change, big G, mm-hmm. the gravitational constant, might be changing also. Mm-hmm. Or, it might have, or it might have changed in the, in the early universe, but then settled down to the value we measure today. Mm-hmm. I keep my eyes open for evidence of that, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. and hopefully we'll learn more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you 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 uh, put forward this um, alternative um, cosmology, and uh, what was the reaction? What uh, I mean, if if you talk about and, and publish, I mean, I know it's it's very much off the mainstream. What was the reaction of colleagues and? Uh, the establishment, so to speak? Well, it wasn't easy, even among the people responsible for my education. Mm -hmm. The reaction was initially negative. And because I came up with these things when I was very young, Mm -hmm. when I was in university in my mid-teens, I -hmm. would come up with these things. They'd be initially rejected, Mm -hmm. just like an actress. I had to, (laughs) you know, Live with the rejection and move on, knowing mm-hmm. that you get a thick skin. So after, a while. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, these we we are talking. I mean, we're talking about a relation between uh, you, you proposing this this formula G M, right? The gravitational constant times the mass of the universe is uh, T, the age of the universe, times uh, C to the third power. You, you can phrase that a little bit differently, uh, introduce the radius of the universe or whatever, or, or put a factor in. But I mean, we are talking about a relation that has been investigated um, by a lot of famous people. I mean, by Erwin Schrödinger, uh, you can trace back even Einstein's thoughts to this. There is a relation, as you mentioned, to Paul Dirac. Um, there is, aside from, from the fact that it is a, a, relation, uh, a realization of Mach's principle. No? I mean, Mach could not see that because there was no cosmology at the time, but it somehow reflects the fact that he said that uh, gravity uh, has its origin in the universe. I mean, that's a formula that that contains that Machian thought, right? So um, you, you want to confirm that, <laughs> that this is a Machian uh, idea uh, or? Oh, yes, it's very similar to Mach's principle, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which you know, says that, you know, that what we perceive as gravitation is related to the, the mm-hmm. mass of the universe. And that's where mm-hmm. big M comes from, that the universe has a mass, just mm-hmm. like the earth as a size and a shape and a mass, we can calculate what it is for the universe. Mm-hmm. And yes, Mach, Ernst Mach was an enormous inspiration. Oh, yeah. I should say, you know, physicists today tend to, tend to worship Einstein like some sort of idol, but we can go far beyond Einstein, mm-hmm. just which ought to be obvious because I have the advantage of 100 years of learning and observations. So mm-hmm. I can do things that Einstein couldn't even mm-hmm. surpass his achievements. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, we have this wealth of fantastic data today, but I think uh, we're not yet doing to the best the best out of it. Um, but what I want to say before, I mean, uh, regarding this reaction, I mean, given that such famous people and, and, and certainly neither Mach nor Einstein nor Dirac were stupid people, I, they all um, dealt with this uh, relation. So, I mean... Um, have you ever have you ever uh, seen any serious consideration of of these people who rejected your hypothesis? I mean, didn't did they even know about that there was um, there was this history behind this Marx principle? Or on what I mean, on what grounds do you do you say? Oh, this is nonsense. This is alternative. Though. I mean. Uh, 
Well, you'll find that scientists or mm -hmm. people who call themselves scientists have many, many prejudices, mm -hmm. not just prejudices against women or women mm -hmm. or people of the wrong skin color, but, mm -hmm. um, but against something even bigger against what's inside, against mm -hmm. anything that's different. They mm -hmm. will, t they claim that religion doesn't guide them, but they follow certain things religiously, <laughs> worship certain <laughs> figures that's, like idols. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. with whatever they're studying, be it inflation or string theory, they mm -hmm. follow it with a religious fervor and won't allow mm -hmm. anyone to question it. Mm -hmm. That is how science mm -hmm. has, that's how it worked in the time of Galileo and people haven't really changed much since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're giving me a uh, um, uh, opportunity. There is a little sideline uh, 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 regarding religious favor, people acting like that. I noticed that you're, I, I mean, of course you're, let's say a little bit famous you have your wikipedia page but people are not right now trying to delete it i mean what's what's that i mean that's very strange isn't it or how do you relate that or do you think this coming out of the science I, i guess it's coming out of the scientific uh, corner right so oh, yes and, yeah oh yes and anyone who looked in your audience who looks up my Wikipedia page can see that this week it's been nominated for deletion yeah. and people are arguing over whether my work is significant. <laughs> I have one quote it's kind here. Kind of absurd, yeah. I mean, maybe you have seen my, my uh, video about uh, Wikipedia, the, the most absurd <laughs> edit ever about the variable speed of light. And I, uh, I talk about the fact that Einstein was the very first person to think about variable speed of light, and they, these guys deleted that from the variable speed of light article. So, yeah, it's uh, it's really strange. I, I said that Wikipedia is is has been. I mean, I think it's a wonderful idea, but it has been hijacked by these medium IQ activists who think that oh we want to belong to science and we have to eliminate anything which is not pure and good science to preserve pure truth in science and at the end they're doing the very opposite of science it's, uh, eliminating alternative ideas but uh, yeah that's that's the sad state of of this uh, of this enterprise I think yeah 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 I guess you can Kind of be kind of proud to be attacked there because there is um, there is Nassim Taleb, I think, the philosopher who says, uh, um, "What do you say? You never you never win an argument unless you are attacked in person." <laughs> so maybe this is just the stage where you're going to win the argument. <laughs> yes, and I should say the. the The attackers, the people who want to pull this off of Wikipedia, they're very, very small people. Oh, one, one of them said about my speed of light, only very credulous sources report on such things. Yeah. But the person who wrote yeah, this... Credulous sources like the Journal, Journal of Applied Math and Physics. Yeah, okay. Uh, I see. <laughs> I should say the person who wrote this, and I've been on my computer, can track these messages down to their source. The person who wrote this Mm -hmm. is a very sad human being. Mm -hmm. He has no college degree, no job, lives in Galveston, Texas with his parents mm -hmm. as a middle-aged man. Mm -hmm. This person has no authority whatsoever, but mm -hmm. anyone can sign up as a Wikipedia editor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you're not going to, 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 to go into that, that struggling, but I mean, that, that's, I think that's kind of the usual biography. I and mean, uh, for that reason, <laughs> these people have a lot of time to rest. <laughs> a lot of time. <laughs> Yes, they have much. Okay, let's, a lot of let's, let's move to something serious, um, to to the question. I mean, I loved one phrase in your paper, and that is, it's like many observations indicate that the universe expands, but not why. Yeah, I love that because uh, it. I mean, obviously, you are behind the big questions in physics, and um, I think um, it's one thing that. I, an idea might be alternative or not or off the mainstream but I think true science has always dealt with the, the big questions yeah not the details what's the percentage of the Hubble constants or what's the baryonic uh, uh, acoustic oscillations there and there but I mean why is there uh, a Hubble expansion at all or why has the gravitational constants 
the value it has, right? So exactly. Oh, oh yes, exactly. You know what we call the Big Bang theory is a good title for a TV show, but it's not really a theory. It's observations. We have observations that indicate the universe expands, but mm -hmm. no mechanism behind it. What I did is find the mathematics behind it that indicate why should it be expanding and not contracting or just remaining in a steady state. Mm -hmm. you know, making, yeah. you know, turning this into a true theory, which we didn't have before, before now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because, I mean, uh, I think that that's what I'm arguing too, that the, the variable speed of light uh, approach is, I mean, it's neither uh, the classical Big Bang, nor is it the steady state. I mean, both are wrong in a sense, and that's why they produce a lot, a lot of observational contradictions. The Big Bang has a lot of problems, and also the steady state may have even bigger problems, but the solution is probably both are wrong. Okay, yeah. Oh, yes, I agree. So um, you are also... Um, you have also proposed um, a dependency of the uh, 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 of the growth of the horizon, and also a, a dependency, a, a temporal dependency of the speed of light. It decreases over the over the evolution of the universe of the cosmos, right? Oh yes, and that's that a direct consequence of of that. Yeah, of of that formula. Mm -hmm. So I promised not to be too tactical, but what I would uh, would be interested, I mean, uh, more or less, you can equate approximately um, the radius with uh, the speed of light times the age of the universe, the so TC equals more or less R. So what prompted you to use that formulation with TC to the third power instead of just using RC squared as has other people have proposed, like Dicke and uh, and or Schrödinger or whoever, um, or is it just not that important? Could be. Yeah. Uh, well, um, the mathematics I did um, predicted, you know, that equation that gm equals t c cubed. Though mm -hmm. I should say there's plenty of room, you know, for varying speed of light ideas. Once we found the speed of light changes, there's room to ask, you know, how much does it change? Is it you know, related to TC cubed or does it change by T to the one half or some mm -hmm. other factor? Mm -hmm. you know, once we start looking at this, there's room for plenty of ideas mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. about the speed of light, you know, mm -hmm. plenty, mm -hmm. of, plenty of ways to predict it. Someday we'll have enough people for a whole conference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know that I, I mean, there are also arguments you can argue that uh, the, the uh, radius or the horizon is increasing like uh, the square of t, so t to the one half, and you're proposing, I think, t to uh, one third. But I think you're close, even closer to Paul Dirac's original uh, 1938 paper, where he introduced that that uh, expansion uh, that expansion factor curiously without considering variable speed of light. So I always was. Um, I, I really uh, was wondering, I mean, Dirac was so close with his hypothesis, his ingenious observation, uh, but he was so close to discovering variable speed of light, but he did not explicitly consider it, right? Uh, no, he did not. He considered other things like G changing, but he never mm -hmm. considered a, a changing speed of light. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it, I mean, it would be fairly fairly logical to to arrive there. I think it's kind of kind of tragic that I mean, that Dicky, uh, that Dirac and Dicky, Dicky, who also proposed an alternative model for gravity based on variable speed of light, they didn't talk to each other about that matter. They were just struggling a, a pity argument uh, over a pity argument. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of sad, right? That. Uh, <laughs> It is sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think? Um, I mean, in a certain sense, uh, the the uh, we have all that access to information today. I mean, I can I can Google Dirac's large numbers and Schrödinger's paper, and 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 so it, it's it's kind of easy to to put things together. Uh, but I mean. 
people at the time, I mean, Einstein did not know about Dirac's ideas and vice versa, because they it was just impossible to, to find a, a scientific paper in all this mess of, of the libraries. So we have, we have such fantastic uh, uh, methods available today. But um, sometimes we're not able to connecting the dots. Is, is that your impression or? Yes, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. In the best of times, you know, we have access to these incredible machines, which mm -hmm. allow us to talk like this on the other side of the world. And we have at our fingertips all sorts of information, almost yeah. the entire learning of the world. But mm -hmm. we also live in the time that writers like George Orwell and Aldous Huxley warned us about a mm. time of totalitarianism when yeah. people would take control of these machines and try to control what we could read or, or what was accepted. And yeah. we see that all the time from Wikipedia to archive to Twitter, people try to control what we see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we could continue to talk about Orwell. I would like that. But uh, yeah, maybe if you, if you put stuff on, on YouTube, you all it has to, to cross, then does it, does it contain, I mean, disputed content or something like that? <laughs> we should stop here. But uh, just to add, yeah, I'm talking with Louise and she's in Hawaii and I'm in Munich. So we're 11 hours uh, and it works. It's incredible. But we're not we're not able to connecting some some simple dots. So tell me a little bit about your your uh, NASA experience and and your uh, th that was a kind of scientific acti activity, not not the theoretical in first place, but very practical, very close to the yeah, interesting stuff to moon uh, moon landings or or the the rocks from there um tell me about your your uh your nasa work and and and, and the relations to your scientific ideas there well i was very very fortunate at a younger age to be, to be chosen to work as a scientist in the middle of nasa johnson space center in houston a place that i had dreamed about since i was a little girl mm -hmm. and it was a dream come true Mm -hmm. Well, learning about a, a strange so, world. And did it take you as, as what? Did you already have a university degree? Oh, oh yes. I, mm -hmm. I already had education. Mm -hmm. though, yeah. though, for a government agency, NASA is pretty good about that. Even if you don't have exactly the degree they want, they will take you in any way and sometimes even pay for you to get another degree. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very diverse place. They say it's one of the best U.S. government agencies to work for. Mm -hmm. And I met many people inspired me every day. I would meet astronauts, women, you know, who had been fighter pilots or scientists mm -hmm. and had enormous achievements and who had been into space. Mm -hmm. And I got to work on very important things, you know, studying the moon for any hazards, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing those experiments with the lunar samples and mm -hmm. in my spare time using the moon to test theories of cosmology about mm -hmm. things like the speed of light. It mm -hmm. was a very, very exciting exciting place to work in and it's mm -hmm. helped in on not just in my research but even in my film work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what was your first job there at, at nasa and, and uh, oh, we, your first project uh, uh, oh my first project was a study which we published on um whether the lunar dust was a hazard to human health so if someday oh, when okay. people land on the moon again and they're exposed okay. to the dust or inhale it whether it's a hazard to their lungs. That's obviously an important practical question, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you got involved. What, what investigations did you do with the, with the stuff, uh, with the uh, rocks and, and sand or samples? Or... So, so you had these samples in your hands? Uh... Oh, yes. Well, I, I worked on them you know, through yeah. a glove box when the samples were inside a nitrogen atmosphere to protect mm -hmm. them from contamination by mm -hmm. Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, we used them. We, we studied the size of the samples. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm proud of, we, we studied how they fall in gravity mm -hmm. in different atmospheres, mm -hmm. which you know, tells us how much of a hazard they would be if mm -hmm. dust were loose in a spacecraft, how long would it take to fall to the floor? Mm -hmm. And that indirectly helped what I've worked on more recently you know, mm -hmm. about gravitational mass, whether it's quantized mm -hmm. and whether gravity 
and quantum mechanics are really just part of one big theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that, that's great. I mean, message to the people who accuse us of being off mainstream cosmology and comparing us to conspiracy theorists. Uh, we're not that kind of a, a conspiracy theorists that deny the landing of the, of, on the moon, right? <laughs> so, that's right. Yeah. I had to be a very trustworthy person. Yeah. I had to have a security clearance. I mm -hmm. learned things that were top secrets, things I can't even talk about today. Mm -hmm. I was considered very trustworthy. And okay. also, I was able to work in pure research, getting mm -hmm. paid for it without even having to teach classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So somehow the military is is behind there, right? That's what you can say, I guess. Or <laughs> so if you need a security clearance, it's not for some kindergarten uh, uh, stuff. Uh, oh, that's right. You know, yeah. not everybody can get one. If I had yeah. if I had a criminal record, I couldn't get one. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, despite all the military activity there, I mean, NASA is doing something something useful too. Let's, let's agree on that. And, and also, I mean, we have we have a lot of findings based on that. Also, the the lunar laser ranging is possible now because we have the mirrors there, right? Yeah. And lunar lunar ra laser ranging is, uh, yeah, so to speak, at the core of your. Of, of the evidence you, you take for your theories and um, would you would you like to expand on that or or the uh, the the distance measurements are oh yes very good data yeah oh yes Galileo tried to test the speed of light by placing lanterns on distant hilltops but didn't have a distant enough hill mm -hmm. we've had the distant hill of the moon because <laughs> of the lunar laser ranging experiment that astronauts left on the moon. We can measure the moon's distance down to the centimeter. Mm. Now, many things change over time. The moon's distance has been increasing. Mm -hmm. But I found that the value from the laser range experiment differs from independent experiments. Mm -hmm. And the difference is explained by a changing speed of light, that mm -hmm. the speed of laser light has been slowing over 50 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so, yes. we should mention here that there is, there is a problem as a matter of principle if you want to if you consider variable speed of light, it's not that you measure, oh, here it's uh, different, here it's faster than there, and then you simply uh, measure it because you always always have the relation um, speed of light is frequency times wavelength. And of course this uh, holds and, and if, Uh, the speed of light changes, then fre frequencies of the atoms and the wavelengths must change accordingly. But it's not that simple to to determine determine this directly. So, but uh, as you say, there is uh, there is indirect evidence. And um, however, I mean, yeah, you. Uh, if again, I may go to the detail here. Uh, there is. There is a, or maybe you can uh, expand on that. There is, uh, what's the independent data? There is a, a comparison to the, um, to the increasing distance of the moon due to another effect of geophysics, right? Um, yes, it was thought that the anomaly might be due to something called glacial isostatic compensation, which is too complex to explain here. And it turns out to be just an inference like dark energy. Okay, no one knows. it's too complicated. I, I was talking about you have you have tidal friction, right? Yes. And okay. due to tidal friction, uh, the uh, Earth Moon system has to conserve its angular momentum. And for that reason, uh, I mean, everything conventional theory, the, the moon would slightly increase its distance, right? Yes. So that's one thing. But uh, you can, you have independent uh, measurements of, of this. And one, Uh, you mentioned in your paper the these investigation by Stevenson about uh, ancient eclipses, right? Yes. And uh, the ancient eclipses uh, measure, so to speak, the variation of the Earth rotation over the centuries. That's right. Because uh, clearly, if if the if the uh, Earth rotation would not slow down, we would have had these ecl ancient eclipses not in, say, today's Iraq, but in Spain. Yeah? And That's we, we, by, by comparing these numbers, you, you get a pretty good estimate of the, um, 
of the slowdown of the Earth's rotation, and correspondingly, we can compute the distance uh, of the Moon. But it does not fit. I noticed. I also noticed that it does not quite uh, fit. So, and, and and yeah, one obvious possibility is a changing speed of light. But have have you considered also a changing um, gravitational constant? Because I mean, also a changing gravitational constant would evidently possibly cause um, increasing distance from the in this system, right? Oh yes, I have considered that. In mm. my paper, I say it can be answered by the hypothesis of sea changing, but mm. it could also be explained by a changing G. Mm -hmm. Now there have been, you know various experiments to try to measure G. One of them used data from the Viking lander on Mars. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, I know the Viking um, um, data. And I, 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 I see, I see. The, 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 Viking, the Viking land, I think it's one of the best uh, data we have. Uh, the problem is, however, I mean, once you enter, maybe you also notice that in the calculation. I mean, once you enter that business of changing constants, we have all these interrelations. I mean, you have a changing C is related to the gravitational constant. So if one is changing, the other changes. Then you have an expanding uh, universe, or you have T obviously that increases the age of the universe, it increases every day. And uh, if you have C changing, then uh, atomic wavelengths and frequency have to change. So you're in this. Um, let's say totally different world of changing scales, and it's 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 kind of drives you crazy if you want to make quantitative predictions. What at the end you observe, because also your your yardsticks with which you're performing the experiments, they are sub subject to change as well. That's the problem, right? So, um, oh yes, it's a it's a problem when Ole Romer first measured the speed of light back in mm -hmm. 1676, right. there was a lot of resistance because mm -hmm. most astronomers wanted to think the speed of light was instantaneous because if it had a speed, mm -hmm. it would mess up all their calculations. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. wanted to use Jupiter's moons as a big clock in the sky to help yeah. sailors determine longitude and justify the expense of the Paris Observatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of re resistance back then too, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, um, the uh, changing at that time you mentioned that uh, C, so to speak, C was the even the first constant of, of nature that appeared. And, but at the time Römer it, uh, discovered it was uh, well, just an astronomical curiosity, more than anything fundamental, right? And uh, but it, it turns out now, now that. It's one of the most mysterious constants of nature. We, we have yet to explain, right? Oh, yes. It was, in Romer's time, it was an anomaly. Why mm. Jupiter's moons would sometimes show up late. Mm -hmm. And yes, and since then, we've not been able to measure the speed of light. But why it's that speed? Why not faster? Why not slower? Why not instantaneous? That has been a mystery until now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have also uh, 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 other constants of nature you're interested in, but you, you never went to particle physics or that stuff or that kind of uh, fundamental physics you're not interested or? Well, I'm interested. It's not exactly what I study, but I follow what's happening in particle physics. Mm -hmm. And yes, I enjoy, I enjoy your videos. Often they seem creatively bankrupt, just asking for more and more money to build bigger and bigger colliders to find mm -hmm. these hypothetical particles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes, I, I do follow it, but it's not exactly my field. Though the speed of light business does um, apply to microscopic things like the Planck values, indicating mm -hmm. whether they are fundamental. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't mean not, not so much I intended the critique, but I mean, you know that in Dirac's 1938 paper, there is this his uh, statement that these uh, maybe for the, for the audience, we just should repeat the uh, Dirac's large numbers. Uh, you have this uh, relation of the electrical force in the hydrogen atom to the gravitational force, and it's an incredibly huge number, ten to the forty. 
And uh, Dirac also always wondered about this uh, huge number and until he discovered with the beginning of cosmology that you have almost the same number with uh, 40, uh, the same number with 40 digits if you compare the radius of the universe to the radius of the proton, right? And not only that, that is, that is quite well known, but almost nobody talks about the second hypothesis of uh, the 10 to the 80 particles in the universe, which is a very independent observation. And well, 10 to the 80 is the square of 10 to the 40. It's very, very mysterious. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I coming back to, to this quote, he said that there is a very deep connection between cosmology and, um, and uh, atomic physics. Uh, you agree on that? Or, but... Oh, yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. And just the recent work suggesting that these Planck units could be fundamental units. That's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's, oh, it's something we're discovering every day. Yeah. Could yeah. It even apply to the size of the cells in our bodies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Planck's units are the, are usually at 20 orders of magnitude, so to speak, outside uh, other stuff. I mean, uh, the Planck length is 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the proton. And on the other hand, uh, Planck mass is 20 orders of magnitude more or less heavier than the proton. So... Um, in this way, it relates it relates to the to the uh, Dirac's to Dirac's numbers uh, forty or forty digits. Um, so, what what do you think? That would be kind of, kind of new to me. I mean, could be I could be even skeptical about that claim about uh, about molecules. And uh, you want to expand on that? Uh, oh, oh yes, and this is a very recent theory, mm -hmm. but um, and it it says that. Uh, that the math predicts that the Planck units are fundamental. Now, mm -hmm. the Planck time and length are too tiny for us to measure, but the Planck yes. mass is about the mass of an eyelash hair or a flea's mm -hmm. egg. It's something we can see. Mm -hmm. Now, lots of things are smaller than Planck's mass, but those things might have an inertial and not gravitational mass. Mm -hmm. Gravitational mass, according to relativity, causes space time to be curved. So according to this theory, the Planck mass, gravitational mass is fundamental. And this is a difficult thing to, to explain if we've spent our whole life in Earth's gravity. But mm -hmm. basically, if Galileo were to drop two fleas' eggs from the leaning tower, they fall mm -hmm. towards Earth because Earth is big. But mm -hmm. they would not attract each other because individually they're too tiny to cause curvature of space and time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This would explain many things. You can test it in a simple experiment where you place two tiny masses in a vacuum and see if they attract each other. Mm -hmm. And it also explains why living things are divided into cells of less than Planck's mass. Mm -hmm. If the cell were bigger than Planck's mass, it would experience self-gravity, mm -hmm. which would interfere with its internal functions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would explain why our life is divided into cells, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which shows that yeah. study of cosmology can affect our everyday lives. Mm -hmm. And that, that's and interesting. That is... Not necess not necessarily. I agree, but what I like is that I mean that's kind of funny from a math methodological point of view. I mean, you're proposing something concrete, the Planck mass, where you can actually measure all these string guys uh, with their fantasies. They're focusing on the Planck time and Planck. Uh, uh, length and it's guaranteed that nobody ever would measure do a measurement at, at this uh, scale and and so it's uh, uh, so you you could come up with the, with the question it would be justified so why you guys don't talk uh, about the plant mass instead of all these plant <laughs> planks it's they kind of escape to the island of falsifiability non falsifiability right so but this is this is method the other thing uh, that comes to my mind is that it's interesting you're distinguishing so you would you would make a difference between gravitational and inertial mass that claim that the equivalence principle is not necessarily valid on on that scales yeah that, that's correct and this that, relates to what you talked about about inertial mass the origins of inertia 
Mm -hmm. which is a fascinating thing for us to explore. You know, what Mm -hmm. is the origin of inertia and inertial mass? If if it turns out that inertial mass and gravitational mass are not always equal, that Mm -hmm. would mean even revising Newton's theory of gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that's that's part of the problem. If you uh, if you consider the variable speed of light, and if you uh, consider all these Machian ideas in general, you're not only attacking Einstein; <laughs> you're also attacking Newton, and that's too much for uh, for many people. So, but if you if you seriously wonder about the origin of of the gravitational constant, you arrive there. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that also. Have you heard of Mike McCulloch? He is also uh, a theory of quantum inertia. And he does, does also distinguish between inertial and gravitational mass and claims that there is a cosmological influence on a, a, a cosmological modification uh, that distinguishes inertial from, from gravitational mass. Yeah, I've heard of that work. I've not studied it in detail. It sounds like something I should read more yeah, about yeah i will send you send you the link um, um another thing that comes to my mind maybe for that reason i should be skeptical we have to check if there are experiments recent experiments involving the measurement of big g on the atomic level i think there are some atomic beam experiments who at least try to measure the gravitation but i have to look it up yeah i've done a review time ago about uh, big g measurements but and most of most of them they work with the classic torsion balance and for sure they 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 don't arrive at that level of of uh, small mass that's a very general problem the mass dependency if you measure the gravitational constants you have um, usually you have this huge mass of the earth involved or at least two masses of uh, say kilograms but you never go to the atomic level and 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 it's not a continuous um it's not a continuous uh, set of experiments but either you have one kilogram or you have say the ice cap of greenland would be the next (laughs) stage and then you have the entire earth but it's not uh so there might be some some unexpected dependencies yeah for me, it's the gravitational constant is, is very mysterious still. Yeah. Very oh, yes. What a wonderful thing to investigate. You, know, you can mm-hmm. think of many experiments and theories we can do about the gravitational constant, whether it has changed over time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And as you say, you know, measurements of G are still in their infancy. They're not very precise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this, this is not, I mean, we shouldn't blame experimenters because I, I admit that it's really, <laughs> I've been to conferences with people really seriously working on these problems, but it's it's just very difficult yeah, to do precision experiments. And uh, interestingly, the there are more precise experiments who try to determine the uh, temporal variation of G and set limits on, on dot G than uh, the precision of G itself. Yeah, you you mentioned the the um, the Viking uh, lander on on Mars, yeah. right? That's a that's the usual limit on on the re- variation of the gravitational constant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is this is one of your next projects to go to that Planck level to test that, or have you? Oh yes, I've designed a simple experiment that any laboratory can reproduce, where we take two tiny spheres the size of, well, slightly smaller than Planck masses, place them on a low friction surface, pump out all the air to simulate the vacuum of space, and observe them. According to laws of gravity, even Newton's law, the two tiny spheres should roll towards each other. Mm -hmm. But in many trials, we haven't seen any sign of gravitational attraction between them. We put in larger. I have to criticize you a little bit because I mean you're a little bit the theorist here. It's very simple, very tiny. But I mean, take two tiny masses, and you said smaller than the Planck mass, and I mean, there's, you, have, you have these several kilograms. I don't know what you're talking of, of milligrams or nanograms in that case, but uh, I mean, it's very, very, very 
small the force right and then if you you have to go to close distances you, you get a bunch of problems with vacuum and and uh getting out any electric effect or or whatever that i i don't imagine it's very easy yeah so yes these are i should say these are only preliminary experiments mm -hmm. they're designed to be easily reproducible mm -hmm. you know to To do it better, we would probably have to go take the experiment into outer space and do it in microgravity, mm -hmm. where there'd be less interference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but I but I definitely agree. And the important point you're making is that um, if there is something mysterious in nature, like the um, law of gravitational interaction or or the uh, Newton's big G, we should cover all possible ranges of, of experiments yes. measure it at all distances not only the torsion balance but go to go to larger distances go to uh to, to stellar distances to, to well i mean <laughs> newton's law doesn't work at the, at the galaxy scale we know that's <laughs> the, the postulate dark matter because newton's law doesn't work and, and even worse but it's not only it's not only the the um the distance scale which is problematic and it's not well covered it's uh also the mass scale as you say we don't have very good experiments involving small masses and there is also the you could also define an acceleration scale yeah and if you go to very tiny accelerations that's where uh, usually people suspect uh um where dark matter is yeah everywhere Every observation which involves 10 to the minus um, 10 to the minus 10 meters per second square, something is wrong. Yeah. Oh yes, I agree. We you know we don't really have you know good experiments for a lot of these things, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but it, so, it makes it a fun thing to explore. Yeah, your take on dark matter. Oh well. Um, a changing speed of light also predicts that there should have been many more black holes formed in the early universe than we think there were, that black holes could have been formed at enormous sizes, you know, forming the, co the cores of the first stars and galaxies. And mm -hmm. there should be lots of tiny black holes out there, and they could be what composes the so-called dark matter. Now, particle mm -hmm. physicists have been resistant to the idea of black holes because they, they study their little fundamental imaginary particles they would like to think their little particles are dark matter mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah. i i can model it just by saying there's a large population of black holes holding the galaxy together since those haven't been mm -hmm. observed there's still room for other ideas like modifications of gravity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well i shall be a little bit skeptical about the issue of, of black holes because i mean let's say if once until we haven't understood very well the gravitational constant um the entire idea of 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 black holes is very related also i think to the constancy or or to the to the conventional ideas so and i guess also i mean i mean dirac's maybe this is too detailed but dirac's hypothesis in a way maybe also phrased um saying that the the density of a nucleus of an atomic nucleus is something uh, significant in nature and i guess not coincidentally the um, density of a nucleus is the highest density we have observed so far in the universe which is at the same time uh, pulsars and neutron stars or uh, also stellar black holes more or less But if you go to small black holes with small masses, you would you would arrive at even uh, even higher densities. And I'm not sure we have. Uh, yeah, I mean, every idea is fine, but I could also be that these are not just not realized. You know? Yes, that is possible too, and I hold open that possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, another you're against dark stuff in the universe. <laughs> oh yeah, dark <laughs> to which energy. I fully is... agree. I'm against the dark stuff too. I wonder when they will start postulating dark substance. Okay, every 20 years in dark matter, dark energy, and dark substance, and dark dark physics. <laughs> um, 
but uh, you have uh, your I should say that your paper is about explaining dark energy by variable speed of light and I'm, I'm very in favor of that explanation I, I think that's the solution if I mean it has turned out that the evidence is much uh, much weaker than it was believed but uh, there is definitely an anomaly in the expansion of the universe something that does not work but involving dark energy is not the is not a smart solution and I think it's much smarter what uh, you did uh, you want to expand on that uh, on on your dark energy idea oh yes and i published this years ago but yes you know the so-called acceleration of the universe can be explained by a changing speed of light so mm -hmm. what they've been ob observing isn't the universe accelerating but the speed of light slowing down mm -hmm. yeah and you know and that's contrary to what most people think because Dark energy can be attractive for some people because any mediocre scientist could come up with a new dark energy theory. <laughs> Just like there have been ones in counting many like, like 500 proposals or what it possibly might consist of. It's, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just like there were once many theories about epicycles. Mm -hmm. But a speed of light would explain all this. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we should we should say that. I mean, somebody might come up now and say, "Oh, we have also the theory of inflation, and inflation also um, talks about a very uh, much uh, greater speed of light at the at the very early phases of the universe." <laughs> what What's your comment on that? Or uh... oh, well, inflation is something which was discredited a long time ago, mm. and people who think it hasn't been discredited live in a fantasy world. It makes yeah. no sense. I tell yeah. audiences that inflation postulates that the universe is flat, like the Earth. Mm. And a, yeah. a flat Earth might seem very quaint and, and silly, but mm -hmm. in graduate school, they teach you the universe is flat because of inflation. Mm. There's no evidence for inflation, no mechanism for inflation. It's a bad idea. It was yeah. never even a theory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I was just glad to hear that because you may... I have mocked inflation theory at many instances, and uh, even Roger Penrose mocks it a lot. I mean, he's the British gentleman. He was very distinguished. I, sh I shall, I shall say that the before going onto that, that I have serious doubts about the very foundations of that because it's contradicts <laughs> this and that. And, uh, just say it's BS. No? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I mean, the point here is, I mean, inflation is another, if you want, another fix put on top of something which is already a mess, which is the standard <laughs> model of co cosmology, and you pull out the other free parameters just to, to fix that. And I, I, I guess we can say that what we are doing here, trying to do here is to go to first principle, not grabbing extra parameters, but to, um, to, to uh, find a fundamental reason for that phenomenon, okay? Because we haven't explained yet the, the Hubble expansion. We haven't explained this and that. And, and uh, maybe there is a, a variation in the gravitational constants or in the speed of light. And that is something very fundamental and does not need extra parameters. But uh, yeah, it's just uh, would be a smarter way to to approach these problems of um, early cosmology, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and the fact that some scientists still follow inflation just proves that scientists can have religious beliefs. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, these are, uh, in this, uh, I mean, in this you are right, we, we are living in kind of dark ages, yeah? it's in a literal sense with dark energy and <laughs> dark matter, but also in dark ages because we have this uh, modern type uh, religion of of the standard models and everyone who is um, I mean you're allowed to do this and that and to 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 debate this little detail and that little detail but once you go to the very foundations and and saying that oh it might all be wrong like the epicycles you're really you get a problem, yeah. It steps on too many toes. But today is also a time of great opportunity. 
you have all these people with their PhDs and their fancy jobs have completely and utterly failed in to explain the universe by any common measure. It provides mm -hmm. enormous opportunity for someone mm -hmm. like me or you to come in and go where no one has gone before yeah. and finally find the solution to these problems. Mm -hmm. It's also a time of great yeah. opportunity. I'm, I'm also an optimist in this sense. Um... Uh, because I mean, it, it's it, at the very end. It's, it's the internet. Let's admit it, 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 which creates all these opportunities, also to connect to people, and to find easily find all these uh, old papers and, and going back to these uh, smart ideas. I think, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to revolutionize the world with something very new. I think every good idea has some relation in the history of physics. Also, if you, if you go to cosmology and if you dig in these old papers, and uh, it's just that um, and at the very end, what 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 uh, heterodox uh, guys like you and me are doing is is I think it's it's more uh, based on uh, serious science than what content the contemporary fashion is 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 dealing with. Yeah. So what other other impressions of your uh, uh, some anecdotes about sociology of science or what do you have noticed or yeah oh yes I go to conferences too and sometimes they can be boring sometimes it seems like they collect thousands of the most mediocre scientists in one place it's mm -hmm. often hard to break out or be noticed you mm -hmm. know when, when all those all those people are only only following their own research and won't look at other ideas even the idea next door Mm. There's definitely a sociology. There's mm. something like a scientific community, and it's difficult to break through, but mm -hmm. it's possible to go around those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I enjoy a good life where I can, you know, lecture mm -hmm. around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, even if a few hundred people in cosmology will never believe my ideas, it's possible to go around them and get to the wider world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've also been to, to many conferences, both alternative and, and classical ones, and I think to a certain degree they have, um, yeah, even a negative effect on, on science because, I mean, if you if you're in a room with five hundred people listening to to one of these main uh, lectures and uh, you know that everyone literally everyone believes that they're in it could be either dark energy or neutrino oscillations, and if you are there and you, you think, I don't believe that. I mean, psychologically, you just feel bad. You <laughs> just feel bad because everything around you is, oh no, 500 <laughs> people against me. So uh, I think we still underestimate that that effect of, of mass psychology in, in, in science. And, and, and true science ha has never been a mass activity. That's the difference between today's science with these big conferences and thousands of people and, and the true scientists who were also individuals. I mean, Newton, who went there on his castle and, and uh, discovered his law, or a Kepler and, and uh, a Faraday, I mean, they, they all worked in isolation. That's, uh, that's much more typical for a scientist than, than this mass activity. Well, science in large groups works like a convoy of ships. A convoy of ships is only as fast as its slowest ship. And some of those ships are very, very slow. When, if one ship outraces the convoy, races far, far ahead, eventually the co it loses sight of the convoy and the convoy has no idea what that fast ship is doing. Mm -hmm. That's how science works. Like a convoy that's only as fast as its slowest ship. Yeah, yeah. Some of those ships have stopped completely. <laughs> Well, yeah, sometimes they wiggle around. Yeah, you know, you know Thomas Gold, no? Thomas of course, Gold. yes. And he he compared he, he did the, did the comparison to ships, but he made it to to uh, a herd of sheep, right? Or was it goose <laughs> or some of the leading goose? And then 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 <laughs> one animal is outside the herd, and, and and then suddenly the flock turns around and it finds itself in another place. And uh, no, no, I haven't moved. No, the flock has moved. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or physicists, it's more like lemmings being stampeded off a cliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what Lee Smallings, how he describes uh, the, the, 
supersymmetry guys. Yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of strange things in uh, in science going on today. I have been complaining a lot sometimes about, but we shouldn't. We should be optimists like you then and take the opportunities. I I agree with that. Yeah. So yeah, that would be a good idea for the end. Being optimists, uh, looking forward to new discoveries of open-minded people. Do you have anything to add? Any anything I missed? Anything important I should mention? Oh. Uh Oh, a few things I'd mention, but one book you might not know about is a textbook, which looks like this, mm -hmm. um, New Trends in Physical Science Research. Okay, so a, you sent me the link and I will pu put it also in the comment section. Uh -huh. Oh yes, it includes a chapter written by me mm -hmm. about the speed of light. So a changing speed of light has reached a textbook. Uh, great, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, but you have also, I will present also your, your book and also your papers but that's that's good material yeah variable speed okay. of light sooner or later it will prevail yeah i guess yeah oh, oh and one more thing i could add someone complained that my uh, film rolls aren't big enough <laughs> but i am working but i am working on a big film or i will be the lead they have been looking for a long time for something which fits my character and background mm -hmm. but it, it's a big budget science fiction film about mm -hmm. The first woman, the first human to go to Mars solo, mm -hmm. and is based entirely upon technology and science we know. A solo mm -hmm. mission to Mars mm -hmm. to be the first one to make it to another planet. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it's something we're working on with the special mm -hmm. effects, and it's going to be a spectacular film. And mm -hmm. if it's finished, I'll be in the lead role. Yeah, yeah. That's I. I think I forgot that you were. Weren't you among the people who were considered for the crew of a space flight or are still in, or, or what about that? Or if oh, yes, for, for a while I was a crew candidate, an astronaut mm -hmm. candidate for a mission called Dear Moon to mm -hmm. travel around the far side of the moon. Mm -hmm. And I haven't made it into the finalists, but that could change. Mm -hmm. I wish them every luck, but they ha I happen to know they have many, many technical challenges before they can think about sending people around the far side of the moon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could help them. So let's hope that the distance to the moon doesn't increase unexpectedly very much <laughs> during that space flight, verifying your theory, but getting you out into space. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, Louise, thank you very much for this very interesting interview. And uh, I guess our audience has, uh, yeah, very uh very good impression of your personality and your scientific activity and uh yeah if uh, i have forgotten something i will put it into the links and uh we keep in touch thank you very much thank you very very much alexander i hope you've enjoyed it too okay okay thank you goodbye thank you bye